What is up, my Squirtle Lights? It is I, your king, welcoming you to the October 2023 edition of Let's Talk. It is so good to be back to daily uploads. I have missed this for the past few months. I mean, I've tried to do some things here and there. Definitely been doing some editing in between, but it just doesn't have the same kick when you're trying to play games on your own time because you have all this free time all of a sudden now that your hobby is on the back burner for a while. It just doesn't really work the same. Like, don't get me wrong, when I'm, when I'm playing games with my friends, it's one thing. I mean, playing games online, Destiny is a great example. In fact, the footage you're probably seeing in the background is just more footage of me raiding with my buddies. That's one thing. But when I'm just playing on my own time all by myself, I'd rather just have the capture running and a microphone in front of me because I feel like I get so much more out of the games that I'm playing when I do that. And it's been great getting back into it. It's been great having this PC. This PC is, I guess, not a beast compared to a lot of people who have spent thousands of dollars on gaming rigs, but for what I need it to do for this channel, it is a game changer to say the least. Uh, I guess we might as well talk about the specs on this thing. Uh, it's got an i7-12700KF, 12 12-core, 12 64 gigabytes of DDR4 RAM, 4 terabyte SSD NVMe, although it also comes with another 1 terabyte stock uh, that came with the motherboard. And then I'm looking at getting another 4, but the only thing that's not really all that impressive, I mean the i7 itself is kind of just, it's nice. It, it, it's more than enough for what I need it to do. But the only thing I would say is probably underwhelming on this PC is the GPU. It's just a very consumer grade RTX 3060 Ti, which, I mean, is a fine GPU, don't get me wrong, it's just not like some high-end GPU or anything, but it is a very popular GPU, one of the most common GPUs on the market. I probably will upgrade that someday, I just don't have a need for doing that right this second, because when it comes to editing videos and trying to make them nice quality and render them quickly, it more than enough does the job. I mean, I can render a 45-minute video in about 30 minutes with this thing. It literally renders faster than the actual length of the video itself. I've never had that with a PC before. The f old Frankenstein PC that died a few months ago would usually take about two to three hours per episode. So yeah, this is a this is a big upgrade for me. It's really nice, and I've been able to upload at like 2K and 4K, although not 4K all that much because that is a little bit overkill with the videos that we have been doing as of late. Haven't been really recording all that many 4K games, and on that note, I haven't really recorded anything on the PC itself just yet, as in PC games, emulated stuff. I haven't done any of that yet, and I probably won't for some time. I need to get a lot more storage space before I'm comfortable with doing that. For right now, I'm just kind of sticking with the normal standard fare that I've been doing for the past several years, and I'll probably will for a little bit longer because obviously getting storage space is more money and there for more time, and it just, it, it's a lot of work, but as of right now, I'm happy with where we're at. I'm happy to be back. Have to be focusing on all these series again. Horizon Forbidden West and Pokemon White are on the home stretch, more or less. Pokemon White is kind of on the home stretch for part one of the Let's Play. We still have the whole end game to worry about, which I haven't even recorded yet, but that's not going to be for a little while. And then Shadow of the Tomb Raider and Pikmin are kind of just getting going. I, I would say that Pikmin is already like a third, maybe a quarter of the way over, but Shadow of the Tomb Raider has a long way to go yet. And then, of course, we're back to variety content. Now, Horizon Forbidden West, let's start with that one really quickly. I have that one recorded in its entirety. It is done. I am through to the end of the Burning Shores. I have recorded every single thing I wanted to in the main game. It is all but over. Really the only thing, and I don't even know if I'm going to do this, I'm still contemplating yet, but really the only thing I'd have left to do is to record this supercut video where I go through all of the Machine Strike games that I didn't play uh, throughout the game, but I'm probably not gonna do that for several months as is. Everything else, though, that I, that I needed to do, it's done. It's basically done. We, I guess we didn't pick up the Platinum Trophy, but it's basically done. Uh, so I'm happy about that. That should be ending next month, as a matter of fact. And so should Pokemon White, at least the credits roll. Uh, after Pokemon White, we're going to be jumping into Poke Park 2, mainly so that I can keep a promise that I made at the beginning of the year, because I I said we would be looking at that. In fact, the initial plan was to do Poke Park 2 immediately after Legends Arceus, but I felt bad uh, jumping into a into a spin-off game after what is technically another spin-off game, so I decided let's go main series and then I'll kind of put Poke Park 2 as sort of sandwich it in the middle of the Pokemon White Let's Play and then we will jump into the end game once that is done. Um, but after Horizon Forbidden West is done, that's where we're going to be jumping into Destiny. I will discuss that more next month because there is a lot to talk about when it comes to bringing that game back. 
Uh, Shadow of the Tomb Raider is obviously just getting started. Uh, it's going to be a while yet before that one is over. That is a longer game than both Tomb Raider 2013 and Rise of the Tomb Raider, which if you remember, the Rise of the Tomb Raider Let's Play was in and of itself a decently long one. I think it was uh, 30 plus episodes. Shadow of the Tomb Raider is probably going to be around there, but with 30 minute episodes. Uh, probably more in the 20s, but these longer episodes, are it's still going to drag out for, oh, I say drag out as if it's a bad thing. It's a great game. I'm having a great time with it, but it's going to be so, uh, probably a few more months at least before that one is over, which means, unfortunately, and this is where I have to break a promise that I made earlier this year, Animal Crossing is not going to be happening this year. I said that that was going to happen, and honestly, it probably would have had this whole delay not happened in the first place, Shadow of the Tomb Raider would have started a lot earlier, probably back in July. Had all of this not happened, it would have been right after Spirit of the North ended, but just because of the whole fiasco, I wasn't able to squeeze Animal Crossing here in time. So that's going to be a next year thing, unfortunately, and we'll talk about that when we get to it. Um, but I do feel bad that that's just not going to happen anymore. I just kind of wanted to confirm that now. Uh, and then we get into Pikmin, which I have been recording, at least I was starting to record in four episode chunks because it is a blind let's play, and I was looking for feedback, but after just two four episode chunks, I realized, holy crap, I'm already on the home stretch with this game because it is so unbelievably short. Now, that's not to say that I'm blasting through it or anything. I'm terrible at Pikmin. Pikmin is an RTS, and as much as I love RTSs, I mean, I grew up on uh, StarCraft and Age of Empires 2 and Age of Mythology and loved those games to death, but I'm terrible at them. I am absolutely terrible at RTSs. I do not have the mindset for that. I am way too ADHD for those sorts of games because trying to manage all of those things simultaneously is just unbelievably difficult for me. I, because that's the thing is you, you can't just, you can't just be really good at managing multiple things. You have to be able to manage those things efficiently too. And that's something I'm never good at. Like I can remember multiple things, but I get sidetracked so easily when playing RTSs that I just constantly lose my place and fall apart. And I mean, I think about those old RTSs I used to play and you know, they'll have like CPU opponents at usually at easy, normal, hard, and then like an even harder difficulty. I could only ever beat opponents on normal in those games. Like that's how good I was. I, I think Age of Mythology was the only one. And even then it was only when I played a couple of the different gods that I was actually capable of beating a hard CPU, but not a very regular thing. I just, I was never good at them. So I go into Pikmin, which obviously isn't the same kind of RTS. It doesn't control the same. It doesn't behave the same, but it is still an RTS in spirit. It still is that multi-management sort of RPG game where you're supposed to be, you're supposed to take care of many different things at once and plan your routes and know exactly what you're doing and, and be thinking multiple steps ahead at all times. I'm so bad at them. I'm just bad. So as much as I'm enjoying the game, I'm struggling at it and I'm not doing the best and I'm kind of just brute forcing my way through it by replenishing my numbers with all of the many losses that I've been getting. Like I'll say right now with the episodes that I've recorded, I've lost all like 100 Pikmin at this point, which is I'm sure to veteran players absolutely terrible. Um, but I will also say that a chunk of those have been to glitches and that's probably been the one sour point with this game so far is that it is a bit buggy but almost all of the really bad glitches I've encountered in the forest naval everywhere else hasn't been too bad and as I continue to go through this game and subsequent games in the series the sequels two three and four I'm sure that that issue goes away and while the games probably do get a little bit harder I am really looking forward to playing more of them because I have been enjoying this series quite a bit but I say all this to say that I'm probably just going to, this week in fact, uh, hunker down and just finish the rest of it. Try to get all 30 parts, finish out the game, and then just call it good from there because this isn't a very long one. And then I can move on to the next game, which I believe in that time slot should be Mario Party 2, although I say that with a little bit of reservation. Let's talk about variety content for a moment, and this, this has to do with that. So... Variety content is back. Uh, started off with a few non-collector's corner games. I started off with The Messenger, Star Wars Racer Revenge. You guys are going to be getting Paradise Killer this week, and then next week is going to be Returnal, Al, as per the schedule, which has probably been up on screen the entire time I've been talking about all of this. Uh, I'm going to be posting one of those every single month, by the way, and I'll, I'll talk about those more in a minute. But you're getting all of those games, and uh, none of them are in the collector's corner. 
uh, series. I, I'm holding off on that one a little bit just because I wanted to bring Variety back with some a bit more well-known games. I started with The Messenger specifically because it is relevant to Sea of Stars, which came out back in August and has been, for anybody who played it, a wonderful, wonderful game. I mean, really the only reason that it is not the best RPG of the year definitively is because Baldur's Gate 3 exists. And even then, they're incomparable RPGs because they're two completely different types of games. As far as JRPGs are concerned, I think Baldur's Gate, or Baldur's Gate, Sea of Stars is far and away the best this year. And for Western RPGs, Baldur's Gate 3 is untouched. They are both phenomenal games, but Sea of Stars has been so wonderful, and I wanted to look at the prequel to that game, specifically because The Messenger is is not like Sea of Stars. They're set in the same universe, they're made by the same developers, but they're different types of games. So if you are an RPG fan, but not somebody who is good at platformers, you probably haven't actually seen or heard about The Messenger, or really didn't even know all that much about it. So I wanted to jump into it with Variety. We played through it for a bit. I really enjoyed it, and I am actually thinking about making that into a series, which is probably what I will replace Pikmin with. Just going through the rest of that game before we move on, and those can be a bit longer episodes as well. Th therefore, it won't be that long of a series that is at least the hope. There is one other series, though, one other game that I've looked at on Variety I wouldn't mind making into a series later, but we'll talk about that when we get to it. It's been fun getting back to these games. Star Wars Racer Revenge was not something I was a huge fan of. Uh, it is definitely not as fun to me as Star Wars Episode One Racer, but that's because that is more of a pure racing game, while Racer Revenge is more of a vehicle combat game. And I'm going to just say this right now, it does not hold a candle to the Burnout series. It certainly tries, but it is not nearly as exciting. Even though it was made by Rainbow Studios, a developer that I actually remember liking when I grew up, but they also did make quite a lot of bad games back then as well. I just, I really liked their MX and ATV series back then. They were some of the more fun uh, extreme sports racing games out there. So I'll give them that at the very least. But yeah, wasn't a fan of Star Wars Racer Revenge, Paradise Killer, Eternal. I don't want to say anything about those, but we'll talk about those when we get to them. So it's been fun getting back into everything. Like I said, you kind of see what the future is like. Next month, Poke Park 2 will start, uh, and as well as Destiny returning, and that's kind of the big feature of next month when it comes back. It's also about when I'm going to get back into recording Destiny, so I'm probably going to be discussing Destiny a lot in the next Let's Talk, but I'll try to forgo it as much as possible this time around. But you see the schedule. I've been posting that. Um, or I, I guess I posted one. I want to post one every single month from here on out. I like to post it on the day before the month starts. So the October schedule went out on September 30th. The November schedule will go out on October 31st, etc., etc. You get the idea. I want to try to be consistent with that because at the very least, I should always be a month ahead on videos at any one given time because otherwise I don't really feel too safe with where I'm at at the moment and I have a lot of work to do. Um, but it should be a good indicator of when each things are starting without spoiling too much in the future as we continue uh, throughout the next several months and years and further beyond that. So yeah, these schedules will be a regular thing. If you have any feedback on those, let me know. I already kind of posted it here in the community tab and I will continue to do so. I did also post it on Twitter. But I want to talk about Twitter for a moment because Twitter is a thing. <laughs> that is a very non-descriptive way of putting that. Holy crap. Wow, I, that sentence meant nothing. Let me, let me start over and say what I meant to say and that Twitter is a terrible website. Holy crap, do I hate Twitter. But unfortunately, I and so many other people are tethered to it for the time being. And I really only am specifically for the purposes of this channel and for staying in contact with a few people. Now, this is where I put out the call and where I put out the link and I put out the information for all of you people. For anybody who still wants to remain in contact with me, I have a blue sky now. It is not a blue sky that is themed around this channel. It is a personal blue sky account. I intend to only use Blue Sky from here on out because Blue Sky represents what I liked about Twitter when I first started using it several years ago. It is a place to chat with friends. Yes, it still does have like trending topics and has a search algorithm and things along those lines. Twitter has always technically had that, but to a degree, it is basically just a big instant messaging chat space where you can talk to people and you have a timeline and you can be interested in things that people say or post interesting things and or funny things and make memes and the sort. This is my blue sky. Levi A S on B sky dot social. Does that make sense? It's just, it's basically just my name is on 
Blue Sky. That's it. I'm just going to post it there. There's a link to it. I currently have Sarai from Sea of Stars as my profile picture. I'm probably not going to be using it too frequently. Like, it's not going to be one of those things where I post there several times a day, every single day. But I am still going to be using it more than absolutely anything else. And eventually the idea is to just completely delete Twitter because I... I refuse to use that website anymore. As long as it is being run by who it's being run by, I want nothing to do with it. It is, it just feels wrong to be on it. It feels morally repugnant, morally abhorrent to be on that website. As much as I don't begrudge anybody else for using it because I get it, I understand why you use it, I just feel bad that we're all railroaded into using this terrible, awful website that nobody else should have to use. And hopefully, I'm hoping that maybe someday, I don't know, when they do something that absolutely puts the nail in the coffin on that darn thing, that everybody will have a better place to go. Because that's really the only reason nobody has left Twitter is because there isn't a reliable space. Like, even Blue Sky, I understand why you guys aren't on there because it's really hard to get an invite code there, especially if you don't know somebody who has one. I've never actually gotten my own invite code that I requested. I've only ever received codes from friends, and that is the most reliable way to get it because once you get on the website, they start to hand out codes to you about once every week or so uh, that you can then give out to your own friends, and just waiting on the actual invite from Blue Sky directly can take several months. I mean, I know I've personally been waiting six months for mine and still haven't gotten it, so... I get it. It's hard to get on there, but it really is the only alternative that is doing the exact same thing. And other than that, the really the only other place that I am is Discord, which I would hesitate to even call a social media platform. It's certainly not a place that you can easily talk to everybody unless you're managed to run a huge server, which I probably won't be doing anytime soon. I probably won't make a Discord server for this YouTube channel anytime in the near future unless I guess something magical happens or something crazy changes. So, uh, yeah. Find me on Blue Sky. There's my account. Go ahead and follow me if you have it. I'll keep my Twitter around for at least a few more months yet. Try to post some updates on there for the time being, but eventually I will be uh, deleting it forever and I will never look back. But all right, I only have a couple more things to discuss today as I've kind of moved past all of the most important things. Um, the only other thing I want to talk about is the games that I actually played these last few months while I was basically just waiting to have the money to be able to get this PC and get back on track. There's only a few worth talking about, honestly, so I'll just sort of stick to those ones that I've really sunk my teeth into besides the obvious uh, and the usual ones that I play. Uh, I'm actually not going to discuss Sea of Stars, mainly because I haven't finished it. Unfortunately, that came li out like right when I got this new PC, which meant that I then had to focus on other things. And it is a 40-hour RPG, so I do have a bit to go in that game, but I'm, I'm loving it so far, don't get me wrong. It's just that, yeah, I haven't been able to finish it with all of these other things that I've been worrying about these past several weeks. So instead, I want to talk about three other games. We got The Good, we got The Great, and then we got The Ugly. So let's start with The Good. The very first game that I played after, and actually sunk like a lot of time into after this PC died on me, the old PC died, and I was like, you know what, I got all this free time, I might as well pick up some long form games because when else am I gonna actually be able to play these things? I gotta actually sink some time into some things, so let's get some games that will actually take a while to beat instead of some short indies that I usually am able to make time for whenever I have that time. And I had this game. I had this game that I had picked up back in 2021, as a matter of fact, for very cheap, actually. $5 for the PlayStation 4 version, even though the game wasn't really all that old. And that game was Cyberpunk 2077. I had no intention of playing it, of course. The reason I got the PlayStation 4 version in the first place at all, even though it is unplayable, was because I knew that that was getting a free upgrade for the PlayStation 5, which is the version that I assumed they were going to eventually fix. But, of course, I didn't even play it at all until June of this year. And I fired it up, and I was playing it, and I was playing it. I should mention right off the bat that I am not a fan of CD Projekt Red, not because of the fiasco with Cyberpunk, honestly. I, I'll, I'll say this right now. Cyberpunk was kind of a vindicating moment for me because I remember going into that game that there was just, just thinking that there was absolutely no way in hell that that game was going to even remotely meet everyone's expectations for it. It just seemed way too soon after Witcher 3, especially with all that it was promising for them to have that game ready. Um, especially because by that point, we were already seeing forecasts of seven, eight, nine, ten year development cycles that a game like that being done in five years was extremely unrealistic. 
So as we got closer to Cyberpunk's release date, the more I was thinking, this isn't going to be ready, this isn't going to work, and then when it comes out, it was a huge disaster. Everyone was acting like their trust was betrayed by a corporation. <laughs> oh, if I had a nickel. But even then, there was a lot of goodwill in Cyberpunk's court that they had then blown, and a lot of people were mad at them. They definitely tried to curry favor with a lot of people, and a lot of people fell for it, and of course, they had their feelings hurt. So CD Projekt Red then became the worst studio in the world and the bane of everyone's existence, and everybody hated them. Now, you might remember that uh, last year, last yeah, it was last year, actually, January of 2022, I posted a video of all of the studios that I have boycotted on this channel. Now, it takes a lot, actually, for me to want to boycott a studio, but it the, the requirements are pretty much the same for everybody. You have to be a big corporation. You have to be absolutely vile. You have to be more than just mean to your employees, more than just mean to your fans. You also just have to be repugnant from the perspective of a game studio in general. You have to meet all three of those criteria for me to think, you know what? I want nothing to do with you, and I refuse to not only play your games, I refuse to cover them on this YouTube channel because I, d I don't want to associate with you. If you want to see what studios those were that I put in that video, go back and watch it. Just type in boycotts in this channel name, and you'll find it very easy. I, there was five studios I named in that video. CD Projekt Red is not one of those studios. Like, yeah, it would have been easy to ride the train and be like, look, CD Projekt Red is the worst studio of all time because they said that they were good to gamers, and then they blew it with Cyberpunk, and we all fell for pre-ordering this. Honestly... As bad as CD Projekt Red was in that department, I still put some blame on the people who actually fell for that because I've fallen for the same things. You want to know what game I bought on day one? And I'm not afraid to make fun of myself for it. I bought Fallout 76 because even though it wasn't a premise that particularly interested me, it was still a Bethesda game and I expected it to at least be fun. I hate that game with every fiber of my being. Oh, and we'll talk about another one that I was super excited for and uh, even fell for the second time. But that's a story for a little bit later. Regardless... Falling for these sorts of things, it happens to people, but there should also be writing on the wall, and you shouldn't pre-order video games. You shouldn't pre-order video games, ever. At least I didn't make that mistake with the game that I'll talk about a little bit later, but again, moving on. CD Projekt Red, they're stupid, okay? They made a big stupid mistake. They made the same mistake that a lot of other studios make. They got way too big in the head, way too arrogant. I mean, game studios do this all the time, especially the corporate ones do this all the time, where they think they can do no wrong, and then they do wrong, and all their goodwill goes down the toilet. It happens. I had no intention of playing Cyberpunk, also because it just wasn't something that interested me all that much. I mean, it was very much positioning itself to be this open-world action game, which it had a lot of vibes of, like, a Grand Theft Auto, and I, I'll say this right now, I'm not a fan of those sorts of games. I don't really like them all that much. The whole Cyberpunk aesthetic and world building is not something that I'm a big fan of. So none of those things really interested me all that much. I had no desire to play it, but it was $5. It was sitting in a bargain bin, and everybody knew that the PlayStation 4 version was never going to get fixed, conveniently forgetting the fact that it had a free PS5 upgrade with it, so I picked it up. But to go back to why I don't actually like CD Projekt Red all that much, these controversies aside, I never really liked the Witcher games. They just weren't for me. They were a little bit too RPG-ish for me. I didn't like the combat all that much. I mean, I thought the combat was actually downright terrible. There wasn't really any element of the game that compelled me to keep going. Like, it was well-written, certainly. But I honestly have more interest in the books than I do in the actual games themselves. Or at least watching someone Let's Play it is more interesting to me than actually playing it. Those just aren't the kind of games that click for me all that much. So all of that meant I really had no interest in cyberpunk all that much at the very beginning but yeah like i said got it anyway finally played it back here in june and i gotta say i actually enjoyed it a lot like a lot a lot i was having a lot of fun with this game and yeah there were some things that i didn't like about it certainly and i was still running into the occasional issue and bug here and there but for the most part I was having a great time, and I want to mention that all of this has nothing to do with Phantom Liberty, which obviously just came out a couple of weeks ago. In fact, I haven't even played the game since Phantom Liberty came out. I was mostly just playing it back over the summer, and I didn't finish the game. I think I got about 20 hours into it, but man, was I having a blast. There were so many, many memorable moments. The writing and the dialogue and the character design was so tight. The aesthetics are awesome for a, a, a type of aesthetic that I don't really like all that much. I'm not a big fan 
of cyberpunk worlds, but this one just had me so enraptured, and it had so much to do with the way that it was all framed and presented. There is so much nuance and detail and energy within this world that it is just so interesting and fascinating to play through. And some of the biggest issues with this game, mainly with uh, certain NPCs and their behaviors, were actually fixed in Phantom Liberty. Not entirely, but they were certainly improved with Phantom Liberty. And it's going to be interesting to see how that was affected. But for the most part, I was just enthralled with this game. Just moving around the world and talking to people and running into random events and playing through quest lines and just the conversations between your the main character and certain NPCs and, and side characters that you encounter through the game. Everything was just so well framed. This has got to be one of the most amazingly presented games I've ever seen when it comes to characters just talking to each other. It's like it really is as good and or better than some of the better films out there in the way that you can just listen to these people talk all day long. I mean, it's not true all the way around. There were definitely some conversations that I was like, okay, that's enough. And there were certain characters that got under my skin more than others. But there were certainly a lot of moments where I was willing to just put the controller down and just listen for 10, 20 minutes and just be absolutely satisfied with that. And video games rarely do that for me. Like, I'm good with a couple of minutes here or there if I like a character, but to go that long, to just let myself be sucked into the game like that because of how well-written and how well-presented these characters are, how good the voice acting and the motion capture is that you're just willing to just watch and listen for so long is... It, it's unlike anything else I'd ever played. And it actually feeds into another game that I want to talk about a little bit later. But like I said, not everything was perfect about Cyberpunk. Some of the gameplay was a little bit off here and there. The RPG elements of the game are bare bones at best, terrible at worst. Uh, you know, the skill trees just don't even work in this game. They're so boring to play through and, and upgrade with, and I just wasn't a big fan. I just liked going through the story, experiencing the quests, and playing it as a game should be played, honestly. I am a big fan of it to the point where I actually am heavily considering giving it some time and space on this channel someday in the future. Maybe when all of this has wrapped up, maybe when we're looking to the future at Cyberpunk 2 or whatever, maybe someday I will actually uh, take a look at this game and we can go through it on the channel together and uh, experience all of the wonderfulness that is Night City and the many characters in it because I, yeah, I am thoroughly impressed, thoroughly impressed by what this game actually was supposed to be from the get-go and not what it was at the very beginning because for all of CD Projekt Red's issues, they were still making a very good game here. They just needed to let it bake for at least three more years. Holy crap, guys, let it sit for a minute. You can't constantly be pushing the envelope like this, making these games that have such ridiculously long development cycles and then still expect to get a profit from it within four to five years like you did in the last generation because that's just not how reality works. These projects are getting bigger and you guys have to be more patient if you're going to continue to push that envelope or just make smaller projects. It's It's got to be one or the other. You, you can't have both. I'm sorry, but I know that the game industry is obsessed with that and having their cake and eating it too and yada, yada, yada. That's a discussion for another day. Anyway, Cyberpunk, good game. Talking about great games, I am finally conquering one of my long-standing demons, as I discuss. Probably the oldest game of the three, but still not that old of a game, mind you. It's only about, I think, five years old at this point. Uh, but I'm finally getting around to finishing Monster Hunter World, which is a game that has been not necessarily the bane of my existence, but has been a little bit of a wall for me for some time. Not because of difficulty reasons or anything like that. It's more due to the fact that... Monster Hunter is a game that should really only be experienced with friends. Trying to play through it in a solo environment is not all that fun. That is something that I tried to do on PlayStation back when it came out. And I kind of gave up about a third of the way into the game. Wasn't really all that interested beyond that point. Then I gave it another try a couple of years later with a friend on Xbox. And I got about two thirds of the way into the game. And then we kind of just weren't able to reconvene and meet anymore and sort of fell off of it and moved on to other things. And then it never got finished again. I was about, yeah, like I said, two thirds of the way through to the game. I think I had just made it to high rank and uh, unfortunately wasn't able to go any further than that. Now I am playing it on PC with a different set of friends, multiple friends this time around going through it. And 
we have been having an absolute blast. This game absolutely still holds up, and I love it to death. I really do. I just don't really like the solo experience that much. I mean, I'm more than willing to go and play it solo when I'm just farming for materials and doing random things in the background, more, more of the tedious stuff. Uh, but when actually trying to go through the story and progress through it, it's extremely frustrating solo. Not Again, not because of difficulty, but just because of time. You're basically ensuring that everything is going to take twice as long when you run through it solo. Yes, I know that difficulty scales down and monsters have less health when you're in a solo experience, but you know what also happens when you're solo? You take all of the aggro. You don't have a lot of other people distracting a monster. You are expected to do everything yourself, and that can just make the entire experience much more tedious, much lengthier, and overall, it's just so much better to play with friends. Ideally... I actually think playing with just one other person is the best gameplay-wise, but having more than that is still a blast when you can have multiple different people attacking the monster from all different angles and using different weapon types. But the reason it's nice when you have just one other person is because then you both can also run with your palicos, and that uh, allows to have two other people or two other things that are taking aggro for you. And it, it's I, either way, it's still a blast. Having friends is what makes Monster Hunter what it is. And we have been just blitzing through Monster Hunter World. We intend to get finally to Iceborne this time and get through that as well. It's been an absolute blast. I have been having so much fun with it. Love it to absolute death. Uh, really, my only issue with it is the fact that it it does kind of not plan and doesn't re isn't really made for the co-op experience because... In the story mode, as you're going through it, every single time you go into a mission, like a major mission, a cutscene has to play. And for some reason, if a cutscene has to play, the game will not let you go in as a group. You have to go in, then see the cutscene, then you guys can link up. So on almost every story mission, we were all having to go into the mission individually, watch the cutscene, then two of us would leave the mission and go join the third one to then actually beat it. Which doesn't make any sense that the game railroads you into this when you finish the mission, another cutscene plays, and you're perfectly allowed to be all there and experience the cutscene together. Like, it just doesn't make sense why the game is designed that way. I don't know. Probably the only big issue I have with Monster Hunter World, but otherwise, it has been so fun playing through this game again. And uh, actually seeing it to completion this time is going to be awesome. I've been having a blast with it. It's nice that I'm actually going to be finally finishing a Monster Hunter game when for so long I haven't. Uh, a lot of my Monster Hunter experiences were with some of the earlier games, particularly the first one, Monster Hunter Try, and actually Monster Hunter Freedom Unite, none of which I got very far in because, again, solo experience, not my thing for Monster Hunter. But Monster Hunter World, very good game. Can't wait to get around to playing Unite someday. I know I'm many years behind the curve at this point, and I'm, I'm not like some diehard Monster Hunter fan. It's just fine to fi or fun to finally be getting into these games and actually seeing one all the way through because, yeah, I get it. I get why people like these games so much. They're very, very enjoyable. Now let's talk about the ugly. So one of the main reasons I wanted to get a PC as soon as possible wasn't just because of, well, getting this channel back on track. I also wanted to play a game that was only going to be available on PC for my purposes because I don't own an Xbox Series X. And that game is Starfield. Now, like I said, I made the mistake with Fallout 76 of pre-ordering it back in the day, and that is the last time I will ever do something like that. I honestly should have known better even back then, and I constantly give myself crap for it because I figured, hey, even if this is bad, maybe I'll get my money's worth out of it later down the road. And no, that didn't even happen. I still hate that game. I think it's awful. So with Starfield, I was a little bit smarter, and this time around, I decided to just get it on Game Pass. I decided to just get, get Game Pass, and I actually used Game Pass to play Sea of Stars, so it was already worth the money in that regard. But I was like, hey, while I'm at it, I will finally install Starfield, because I really want to play this game. I am a big fan of Bethesda Softworks. I figured Fallout 76 was a flash in the pan, and, and not in a good way, and that this won't happen again. Skyrim and Fallout 4 are some of my favorite games of all time. And in both cases, there are multiple reasons for that. It isn't just the fact that they have serviceable gameplay, well-fleshed-out worlds, and nice lore, and interesting stories. Not necessarily great stories or great dialogue or anything, but they 
pass. They do well enough to supplement what I think makes for fun gameplay, uh, both for very different reasons. I mean, Skyrim, it's more about the class building and then just seeing how OP you can get and then just going location by location and making your way through all those gathering loot, things of that nature. Same with Fallout 4 to a degree, although Fallout 4 I actually feels a bit easier to break than even Skyrim. And uh, they're, I think that they're just both enjoyable to play. But one of the biggest reasons why I love both of those games is because on top of how the worlds are fleshed out, uh, Elder Scrolls even more so than Fallout, actually. But that's mainly because Bethesda really hasn't done all that much with the Fallout license since they've gotten it. They've kind of just coasted on what it already was. Uh, but what I like about both of them is that they have elements of camp to them. Elder Scrolls is a bit more of a serious universe. It's uh, not nearly as humorous as Fallout, but it also is a bit silly, uh, if that makes sense. Um, I remember the very first time I ever played Skyrim and going into Bleak Falls Barrow and encountering that guy captured in the webs, and then you chase him, and once you free him, he'll just run away from you and go further into a Draugr den, and he's basically been programmed to die at some point because he'll run over a trap, and then this like spiked fence thing will swing towards him and launch him into a wall. I mean, you can't tell me that that gameplay element is meant to be taken completely seriously. No, it's ridiculous. It's silly. He ragdolls across the room and dies in this hilariously comedic way and you grab his the thing that he stole and then you go out and murder all the Draugr that are around him. It's, it's funny. It's silly. It's not meant to be taken ridiculously seriously. It's not po-faced and miserable and drab like so many other games are. Fallout is straight up rooted in dark humor. That is what makes that entire universe what it is. It is a horrible, dismal environment where everybody died because a bunch of nukes fell and wiped out all of civilization. But it is just filled with silly elements. I mean, look at the mascot of the series. Vault Boy is Camp Incarnate. He is a silly, goofy, ironic character that is supposed to exemplify just how horrific capitalism got in the universe of Fallout and took it to where it ended up becoming before the bombs dropped. It's all meant to be taken with a grain of salt, and that's what makes Fallout so wonderful. Yeah, there are some super serious moments there, here and there, but that's just good world building, in my opinion. You have to have some of that amongst all of the dark humor. And I've always liked that about Fallout. So going into Starfield, I expected some of that Bethesda camp to remain intact. I expected there to be some silliness to it. I wanted to see some things that were rewarding and some interesting Easter eggs and moments that would make me chuckle and make me laugh and make the game more entertaining than the mere expectation that just shooting things is fun in and of its own right. Because Starfield does have the best gunplay that any Bethesda game has ever had. You want to know what? It's still not as good as something like a Destiny or a Titanfall 2, so I'm not playing the game for that reason at all. I want to experience a fun, reasonably exciting RPG that's got some silly elements to it, has some okay, passable RPG elements, has some nice loot to pick up, and has just some interesting happenstances. And I got probably one of the most boring games that I have ever played in my entire life. I absolutely hate this game. I spent probably the first eight hours in a Star Wars The Phantom Menace level of denial. Like where, you know, where people were sitting in the theaters and going, you know what, this movie is amazing. And don't get me wrong, kids absolutely were. But adults, I think, were all tricking themselves into thinking the movie was good until the following hours and days and weeks and months where everybody sort of turned on it. For me... That's what Starfield was. For like eight hours, I was like, okay, it's going to pick up. It's an RPG. It takes a while. It's a video game. I can't expect it to be good in an hour or two. I got to give it like eight hours, and then I'll eventually find something that clicks. And then I spent the next six hours basically hate playing it, brute forcing it, and hoping to God, hoping to something, anything, that this game would end up turning out at least passable. And I didn't find an iota of entertainment in 14 hours of play before I deleted the thing and have sworn it off until, I don't know, maybe someday modders can work some absolute magic on that disaster of a video game. Because I play something like Starfield, and I just look at Cyberpunk, which I had been playing a couple of months ago, and see that Starfield is trying to do a lot of the same things that Cyberpunk was doing. Starfield goes more of an action-y route than what Fallout and Skyrim were. With Skyrim, the action is explicitly Elder Scrolls. It is what it is because it's the only game doing that. Fallout, you can get away with the bad gun play because you have something like VATS to supplement it, which is a very RPG-ish mechanic. 
Starfield's a shooter, straight up. Like, the combat makes it a shooter. Like, yes, it has RPG elements and crafting and other th things on top of that, but as far as, like, the core gameplay, it's a shooter. That then has the usual Bethesda fare of dialogue choices and talking to NPCs and getting quests and all that stuff. Cyberpunk does the exact same thing. Like, exactly the same thing. I'd say the choices of your dialogue are a bit more inconsequential than a Bethesda RPG, but other than that, it's an action game. It's primarily a shooter and it's got dialogue trees and it's got characters that you talk to and things that you pick up and cyberpunk does all of those things better than starfield every single last one and that is pathetic that is absolutely pathetic that even the things that bethesda thinks that they are the best at are not as good as cyberpunk like I know we've all made jokes that Bethesda has been left behind for so many years that they have had all these dated mechanics. Fallout 4, uh, people were saying that all the time. But it had things, I think, it had things that actually still made it fun to play, that still made it exciting, that still made it stand out from the crowd. Starfield has none of those things because Starfield is, in essence, a first-person shooter that happens to have dialogue trees that is also trying to take every single mechanic from every space RPG ever not learn from all of the mistakes that those space RPGs have made and is instead just a constant time waster. Everything that it does, Elite Dangerous did better, Starfield did better, Call of Duty and Titanfall do better, Cyberpunk does better, you name it. You pick a mechanic that Starfield has and there are other games that do it better. There are some mechanics in Starfield that it does significantly worse than all of those games. There is practically a whole subsection of Starfield that is straight up ripped right out of No Man's Sky. It is like the exact same idea as of what No Man's Sky predominantly does to a T. And No Man's Sky does it so much better. Yes, that is a game that has had years of user and community feedback to build upon and several updates here and there, but it is also a significantly older game. It is a game that Bethesda was able to look at for all these years and think, what can we do better than these guys? But instead, they took all of those ideas, didn't even implement them, or probably didn't even look at them at all. I don't know, maybe they thought they were just doing better by virtue of being Bethesda, and they just decided, let's make this as boring as possible. Let's make this as bad as No Man's Sky was when it launched, when it comes to exploring environments and crafting and gathering materials and whatnot. Let's make the space flying the worst possible idea that you could possibly make. You can't actually fly somewhere. You put your spaceship in a bubble that exists around the solar system that it's in. You can't fly to planets. You can't fly to points of interest. You can select those points of interest within space. It's kind of like this middleman that you have. It's like a taxi, okay? Think of that for a second. It's you leave a planet to get in your taxi wherein you then pick your map on or, or selection on the GPS and then you go to that place to actually do anything because in the taxi you have no control okay you're just there and occasionally I don't know you might get into a really bad dogfight or something that's pretty much the worst dogfight mechanics in the history of space shooting I mean my goodness Star Fox 64 is a how old? What is it? A 27-year-old game at this point? 27 years old. And it still does it better than all of you guys. Still. Holy crap, video games. Can we just iterate and improve upon things for once instead of trying to be so flashy? Starfield is just a bunch of JPEGs that you stare at in a spaceship. And eventually you can look at the JPEGs and go, I want to go there. Then you got to navigate through the horrible mess of a UI that is Starfield's UI, find the planet, you get another loading screen, then you go to the planet. Once you're on the planet, then it's, okay, where do I go next? You then have to just walk in a direction or experience another loading screen, and then you can go there and walk around these really plain and boring environments because honestly, for as big as Starfield is, for as big as the idea of Starfield is where you have this big universe full of planets that you can explore and each planet is procedurally generated and massive and has so many places you can walk to and so many things inside of it that you can explore. It feels way smaller than any other Bethesda RPG that I have ever played because all it feels like is that each planet, quote unquote, each city that you go into is like a separate room because there are so few things you can do within that space except for just walk between the things. 
I cannot tell you the magnitude of my disappointment when I finally, it took me eight hours to get to this point, I finally found a cave that I could explore. Okay, and I'm thinking back to Fallout and Skyrim, all these random settlements and caves that I delved into, and there would be lots of enemies in there that I could fight and all this loot that I could get. And I was thinking, okay, finally, I'm going to get some interesting things. I walked through this cave for 20 minutes, like just praying, hoping that something would be in there. There was nothing, and it was so bad. It was proceed. The cave itself was procedurally generated. I couldn't get out of it. I had to reload a save because I could not climb out of that cave. It, I dropped down into it to the only place where there were things that I could pick up, which was like, I want to say it was like a couple of junk items that I could pick up that some dead miners had just dropped because they were dead and just lying there it was like some vials and whatnot and i went and i picked them all up and i was like is this really all that's in here and i navigated the thing for 20 minutes trying to find a way out i could not get out i seriously could not get out there was these ledges that i was apparently meant to climb up that were impossible to traverse over they were like three times my height my jetpack could not get me up and over them i i was screwed i was completely screwed and i had to reload a save that was the very first experience I had with a procedurally generated cave, and there was nothing alive in there. No combat, nothing of interest, no actual loot, except for a couple of junk items I could have sold. That's it. They couldn't even do me the decency of putting a couple of credits discarded on a table, which even in the most benign of Fallout locations, you would at least find like a combat knife stabbed into a table and a couple of bottle caps. Like, are you serious, Starfield? Are you serious? And the characters are so boring. Holy crap, none of them are interesting. It's like they thought Desdemona was the most interesting character from Fallout 4 and copy-pasted her into a hundred different places. Seriously, that's exactly what it feels like. It's not, in it's not cool anymore, guys, making characters that are just straight-laced, straight-faced, and think that they're a badass. It's not, because there's nothing that you could show me that would make them any more interesting than what they are the second I meet them. There's nothing you could do, because you guys are incapable of showing that to me. There is no personality in just stoicism when you copy-paste that across hundreds of characters. Oh, I'm sorry. I know. I'm ranting. I'm rambling. But... I have never been so disappointed in a game. Like, I know some people have just kind of come back down to earth with this one, and they're like, eh, it's like a 7 out of 10. It's it's not like a masterpiece or anything. It's certainly not what Bethesda promises, but it's an all right game. No. No. Listen, I'm a 30-year-old man, okay? I have this channel to run, but even when I don't have this channel to run, believe it or not, as much as a basement dueling nerd as I may sound like, I have a lot of other things going on in my life, okay? I have a lot of other people I could be talking about. I'm not about, here about to tell you that it's like, oh, yeah, I could be going to parties and fucking bitches and all that. No, it's nothing like that. I have friends, okay? I have friends I can hang out with after work, or I could go and talk to them and play video games with them, or, I don't know, I could go see my family or things like that. I could be out doing things. I could go to places, have experiences, watch movies. I've actually been big on movies this year. I have seen probably, oh, I want to say, like 80 new films in the past six months uh, that I've been going through. I got a Letterboxd account. I've been trying to knock out all these different movies. I've been making a, trips to the theater more often, which is really nice because I actually have one directly across the street from me. I go there all the time and try to check out movies. I even check out movies that I would never have any business checking out otherwise. I've checked out a lot of classic movies that I had never seen before. I've been having so much fun with that, and this is all aside from all the many other things that I could be doing with people, let alone on my own. Again, I can be doing stuff on this channel, all right? At my age, most of the time, if you are a video game and you want my attention, you got to fight for it. Starfield doesn't put up a fight. It lays down and dies the second you start it up. It doesn't even make an attempt to fight for your time because it actively wastes it constantly. Everything feels like a loading screen. Everything feels like it's just something that you're just wanting to click through as fast as you can, but it gives off this illusion that you're going to get something worthwhile out of it. And I don't know, maybe it gets good at hour 20. But if a game ever has to take that long to get good, I don't want any part of it. I have no desire because guess what? I could get through five way more interesting indie games in that time. 
Like, do you know how many awesome indie games are in the two to four hour range and are a lot less expensive than Starfield? Because not only could I get through all of those games in that time, I could probably buy that many indie games for the less than $70 asking price that Starfield wants out of me, okay? There's too many video games in this world, Starfield. There's too many video games in this world, Bethesda, for you to be so apathetic. Because that's what this is. It's apathetic, and therefore it is pathetic. I don't like this game. I really don't like this game. Like, to the point where I would give it, like, a 2 out of 10. It's, I have active contempt for it. And unless modders can really put together some magic to save this thing in the future, I will probably never pick it up again. Please, by all means, go watch somebody else's series. In fact, I have every intention to go watch Steven Play's Let's Play of this because I watched his Skyrim and Fallout Let's Plays. I really enjoy his stuff. Uh, he's going through Starfield now, and I don't know how he's thinking about it or what he's thinking about it or if he's sticking with it or whatnot, but that's probably going to be the only way I ever experience that game because otherwise I just don't care. I can't be bothered. And I would much rather go play something like Monster Hunter World or Cyberpunk, or Sea of Stars, or certainly Destiny. So with all that said, guys, thank you all so very much for watching. I know that was a lot this week. Mostly just wanted to take time uh, talking about games and whatnot. Next month, there will be quite a bit to discuss as we move into some new series. So I hope you're all looking forward to that. It is so good to be back, everybody. And I will see you all in the next one.